Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Our Lord calls us to radical conversion. He calls us to be in Him and we, we enter into Christ through faith and baptism. We become a part of His family. But that's only the beginning. Uh, the calling of Christ is a continual abiding in Him as we then are called to holiness, we're called to clean up our acts, but that is only, again, the continuation of being in Christ because uh, in the end, we're called to love. And that love is an expression, both of that gift of our own conversion, as well as an outpouring of that love to others. And often that outpouring of love are to the most needy. And the reason I, I've started this way, because our guest tonight, Jack Tripp, who for want of a better term is a revert to the faith, is the executive director of the Eugene Mission. Uh, you can find his website, eugenemission.org, in which this is about helping the poor, the needy, taking what we've been given, not for ourselves, but for the, the good of others. And I'm sure that'll be a part of our discussion tonight as we welcome to the journey home, Jack Tripp. Jack, it's great to have you on the journey home. Great to be here, it's a real honor. Yeah, well, in our little bit of discussion before I realized we we crossed paths many times that we didn't know it, right? right? You were out in Massachusetts, and of course I spent some time out there, but, but it's good to have you on the program, Jack. And as you know from watching the journey home, the first thing I'm gonna do is get out of the way as soon as I can, invite you to go way back to the beginning and give us some snippets of your of your spiritual journey. Right, well, it's again, I said it's an honor to be here. I've watched the journey home quite often, and um, it's been part of my journey, which I'll talk about. Um, and my life's journey started um, right outside of Ma uh, Boston in a town called Quincy, um, which is famous for having two presidents that were born there, John Quincy <laughs> Adams, John Adams, John Quincy Adams. And I was born into what they called then, and if someone asked me what I was, I was a Boston Irish Catholic. You know, those three words came out all together in the same sentence. So um, I was born to a uh, large Catholic family, um, you know, extended cousins, et cetera, mainly from Ireland, you know, either second generation or almost first generation in some cases. Okay. And, you know, came to Boston like many of the Irish did. Into a culture. Into a culture, exactly. And that's exactly what it was. Um, interesting stories that my parents had, um, and my parents were about as Boston Irish Catholic as you could get. My mom um, grew up in Dorchester in the Savin Hill section. My father grew up actually in the shadow of the Bunker Hill Monument in Charlestown. And so interesting listening to their um, early uh, backgrounds when there was conflict between uh, Irish and Protestants. Um, they, it was interesting, one day they, uh, there was a picture that I saw that had this term N-I-N-A on it in a shop window and I'm saying to my mom, what does Nina mean? And that was um, no Irish need apply. So it was a very interesting time, their time in um, growing up in Boston. And so um, it was a very traditional Catholic uh, family. Um, my earliest memories are going to church, um, you know, going through all of the sacraments. Um, of course, I didn't remember baptism, but uh, first confession, first communion. Um, and then later confirmation. And I will say to your point exactly, it was a culture, you yeah. know? The interesting part was is we never talked about God in our house, <laughs> you know? And so growing up, um, God was truly not all that much part of my background. Um, it was interesting, um, I'll step back a little bit, uh, my father actually went through an entire system of being trained by the Jesuits. So he went to um, a Catholic um, elementary school and then went to Boston College High School and then Boston College. And he was part of the whole GI program. He got out of the Navy after World War II. So classically, he was the first person in his family to go to school. Wow. And, um, so he would have been there when Feeney was there. Um, exactly. Yes. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so he, um, he was fluent in Latin, um, knew all of the, um, you know, the, the laws of the church, etc. cetera. Um, but yet I never really heard much spirituality out of him. Yeah. You know, mm. um, early on we'd, you know, every night we'd say our prayers and go to bed 
and that was the extent of um, you know the sharing of our faith. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it's interesting. I have no blame of anyone whatsoever. Right. Um, <clears throat> And a lot of it probably had to do with the fact I just wasn't interested, but I was exposed to a lot of catechesis, but um, I think maybe it was somewhat rote. And for a little kid, I just didn't grab it. Yeah. You know, I can remember one day talking about this, for some reason this stuck in my head as a sort of typical example. I remember they were talking about the cardinal virtues and I kept thinking they were talking about a bird because I just learned about cardinals, you know, in, in school. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, so that's sort of an example of, of um, you know, I guess of, of me not absorbing really anything, but just going through the, the, the rituals of the sacraments. And, you know, there was something there. You know, I was never an atheist. Um, I always believed that there was a God, um, but just didn't really understand much yeah. about that. Yeah. And, um, you know, the other thing, some of the amazing things, um, that I say are a blessing to the Catholic Church is I really bonded um, with my mother um, at, um, at Mass. Is it was a time, and I'll explain a little bit, but it was a time of great peace for our family. And, you know, I can remember going with her, even just individually, I have three sisters and I'm the only son, is going to her to early Mass. And um, it was set in a small chapel downstairs at the large church we went to. And um, it was just a great time of peace. And it was the one time I saw her have great peace in her life. Mm -hmm. And so that always stuck with me. And so, you know, in whatever ways, the church has always been there, you know. So, um, you know, grew up in this environment, you know, and again, it was, you know, the Morans and the O'Connors and the O'Sullivans and all of the O's. And, um, <laughs> Then my father started moving on as in his career, and we started moving. And um, so we went to Western Massachusetts and then um, back up to um, the North Shore of Massachusetts, as they call it. And things um, uh, started to unravel in my family. And again, we, I had three sisters and uh, myself. And the interesting part is my father was um, a very well-educated man, but a very strict and tough guy. And of course, being the only son sort of directed those efforts towards me. <laughs> and, you know, again, it's taken a long time of forgiveness, but um, I realized early on that he didn't have a father growing up. His father died when he was like three months old. <laughs> so in many cases, he didn't have a role model for what being a great father was all about. And so um, maybe he learned to, to be a father in the in the war, huh? In the, exactly. <laughs> in the military. Yeah, in the military, and it was again sort of a harsh, you know, harsh reality. And he ended up um, in um, manufacturing, um, working, you know, on production lines, which is funny we had talked about. You're familiar with, and that can be a fairly yeah. you know harsh environment where you're dealing with um, a lot of men and um, you know strict. Uh, deadlines, etc., and he was yeah. made for that. Um, but um, what that started doing was putting great pressure on myself, but especially my mom. <laughs> and so um, as things started rolling out, um, she took um, to alcohol as her relief. <laughs> and so she became a, 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 a very, um, very active, very um, addicted to alcohol and it became her life. And you know, it's sort of interesting as you see post how God puts things in your life to then be used later, and I'll talk about that yeah. later, but yeah. what yeah. I'm doing now, I probably couldn't do if, w in the same way I could without this experience of wow. having grown up in a family um, where your mother is an alcoholic. And you know, I just, I loved her greatly and it was just the pressure of that, um, sort of crushing marriage. And, you know, say the interesting thing was my father was extremely loyal. And he did know, you know, the basics of the Catholic faith backwards and forwards. So he knew divorce wasn't an option. And so there was a loyalty even when my mother did um, start, yeah. you know, being involved with this, that he did try to help, you know, as best he could. He didn't know how. <laughs> and sent her to some treatments and et cetera. But so that started becoming sort of the makeup of our family, you know, and for those who are in uh, families with addiction now, 
Um, I'll just say I know what you're going through <laughs> and pray. You know, pray a lot and um, see how God is going to use us because he will. Did your family continue in the, at least the externals of the church during this whole time? So interestingly, um, we still went to Mass um, every Sunday um, for probably through my eighth grade. Hmm. And, um, and then even my parents started falling off from that. What was really interesting is um, my younger sister and I continued to go. And I actually went through high school. And that become, became our time, you know, to kind of bond because I really love my, my sisters. And so it's kind of interesting. I've never really thought about this, but Mass has always been a great refuge for me, you know, even though I may not have understood exactly what was going on back then. So um, it's also interesting when we moved to the North Shore, because my life was so involved in the culture of, you know, being an Irish Catholic, so to speak, and most of my friends were the same. I had very little exposure to um, Protestantism. And it was funny because um, I remember um, the first time that I was exposed was I came back from, I think I was cutting the lawn or something at a uh, um, neighbor's house to help him out. And he was a dean at Gordon College. And really beautiful fellow. And I forget his name. And <clears throat> so I went back and said to my father, well, I know you went to Boston College and he's serving at, you know, as a, um, dean at Gordon College, what's Gordon College all about? And I will give my father great credit for this, is he said, well, you know, Boston College was based, you know, on the Catholic faith, and theirs is more based on the Protestant faith, and went to just explain that these were brothers and sisters of ours, um, but that they just didn't know the fullness of the faith. He actually used that term, I believe. Yeah. So, which was kind of neat. Um, and I cling to those good memories. So. Um, I'm just going to, the audience, our guest uh, tonight is Jack Tripp, and uh, he's the executive director of the Eugene Mission out in Oregon. Uh, yeah, that northern shore is a mixture, isn't it? I mean, it, it, yes. it is, a, uh, I think, partially in many ways, Gordon Con College and Gordon Conwell, which where I went to seminary up on the north shore, were an evangelical reaction against how liberal Harvard had become. And so you have this real strong enclave of evangelicals up in to what at one time was mostly had a lot of Catholics, a lot of Portuguese. Right, a lot uh, of Portuguese, yeah. yeah. Up in the, the fishing villages were almost all Catholic on right. that North Shore. Yeah, and it, it, that's been, an, it's, Massachusetts is sort of an interesting place to have grown up, you know, because, you know, I think if you ask the a Harvard student today, did you know that Harvard started as a seminary? <laughs> you know, they would sit there, um, oh, gosh, that's surprising, you know, I didn't know that, so. Um, but yeah, and again, it was this sort of cultural thing. There was always this interesting, you know, they call them Boston Brahmin, this sort of, it wasn't a tension, but just a knowledge that there were two different sort of yeah. societies within the society. And you know, it, even, again, it was a very cultural thing. My father, for instance, explained to me one um, time we were talking about jobs, you know, and I was thinking, what kind of jobs would I get when I grew up? And he said, you know, he had a fun job as a, um, in um, college um, as part of the public works of Boston. And I said, oh, gosh, that's interesting. How would you get a job like that? And he said, it was cronyism. So yeah. you would know somebody who knew somebody and then you would go to the ward head who would give you that job because you knew someone. So, you know, it just, again, was interesting. I, I probably doesn't even exist anymore, that whole culture, but it, it was a very cultural thing. So um, we continued on as a family you know, and we stayed together. Um, we went through the continuous bouts of, um, you know, almost battles between my parents and um, then the eventual falling of my mother to, you know, a point where it would just be so bad that she'd either have to be institutionalized or, you know, go to a doctor or whatever. And it just left me in a very mm -hmm. agitated state, you know, as a child and one that didn't have a good foundation to it. And interestingly, I think at that time, um, early on, I probably could have turned in one of three ways. You know, one is to the Lord. Number two is to be a self-made man. Or number three is to just become some kind of hoodlum or something. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reasons, God had me choose door number two. And I said, you know what? I got to get out of here. I have to have a life that doesn't involve this kind of misery and where people are healthy and trying to do things. And um, so I sort of made a pact um, 
probably around eighth grade that I was going to do whatever I could to get out of this family and mm -hmm. um, succeed, whatever that meant. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking around for college opportunities, and um, I did not want my father paying for college, you know. And so I looked and um, realized there was this thing called ROTC, and they gave four-year scholarships. And so I got a Navy four-year NROTC scholarship, I praise the Lord. And it was actually a day when I came back with that scholarship. My father said it was one of the greatest days of his life because <laughs> <laughs> there was $50,000 that he didn't have to pay for. So, And I find it really interesting looking back is I had the choice of three different colleges, two of which were Catholic, Boston College and College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, yeah. Massachusetts. And I ended up going to a secular college, University of Rochester, up in Rochester, New York. Yeah. And so um, went through college, and I did go to Mass occasionally. Um, I had a friend of mine, uh, Kevin McNamara, who also was a good um, Irish Catholic boy, and um, he and I would occasionally go to Mass. But, and I tried the Newman Center there, and for whatever reason, nothing stuck. You know? <laughs> and again, I was not an atheist. I just... I was confused, I would say, yeah. and just it, I wasn't feeling any draw towards it. it. I would seem to me it would be tough because your external Catholic culture that you had connected with your mother's alcoholism in a way, could, you could easily see how those could get joined in your mind, the thinking, mm -hmm. that, that these are one and the same. That you know, is, it hadn't really helped her, you know, this is what it's about, so I don't want one, so maybe I don't want either. Yeah. Well, and here's the great point about that question. What it really also did was this. I kept hearing um, from some friends who did love the Lord that it was your Father, you know, in heaven who loves you. I knew what fathers were. I didn't want any piece of that. Yeah. So um, yeah. that was what really drew me, I think, somewhat away from, from religion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's been interesting. Um, I've had these conversations with other um, reverts as well, or those that have fallen away from the faith, that so much your parents can be representative of that, of your faith, yeah. that as the parents go, so go the children, or so go their desire for the faith. And that's why I think it's so important, you know, that parents, you know, are really good parents, you know, and have the Lord in their life when they do so. So um, with that, went through school, and then, um, this is going to be a little tough to talk about, but then in my junior year, um, it was actually the day before uh, Thanksgiving break, and I was working in the dish room. I was always industrious and working in the dish room, and a guy ran in, a buddy of mine, and said, hey, look, at, um, your father just called. Uh, you need to call home. So I called home, and um, uh, my um, sister that was just younger than myself had committed suicide oh. right in our house. Yeah. And um, that crushed our family. That basically blew it apart. And it was an amazing time um, for me for a lot of reasons. Um, number one is there was some real unforgiveness on my part for myself. You know, I kept fantasizing about being, being able to come home a day earlier and save her. Um, there was great guilt on my parents' part because they knew that the stress of growing up in that family had not helped uh, my sister Anne's situation. Um, and that, for the most part, ended any religious affiliation or desire on my, on my family's part. And interestingly, um, although my younger sister still is a Catholic, um, everyone else just fell away. My father never went to church again except for his funeral. And um, one of the interesting things to come at that time, though, and it's stuck in my head for a long time, is we had this wonderful priest that I grew up with. In fact, he, he just went to the Lord, I believe, at the end of last year, Father um, John Mark Hannon, and just a lovely fellow. He, I think, I believe he died. I, I lost contact with him, but I, I looked him up recently. I believe he died actually still serving in about 76. He got a special dispensation to do so. He had been transferred from the suburb we had lived in into a ministry downtown in Boston in Dorchester in a really rough neighborhood. He heard about this and came back and ministered to my mom because wow. he knew what this would do to her. And you know, that was the first true sign for me of seeing a true 
a true priest, a true man of God that was called to serve. And it's, it's really has stuck with me ever since in a really blessed and beautiful way. And so, you know, I actually, I praise God for him. And I, you know, pray that I know he's in heaven. So um, with that, I made the absolute decision that I was going to be my own man, that this stuff isn't working, that anything that looks like religion isn't working, that I just got to do this thing on my own. And so I set off bound and determined to become a success in business. And so um, graduated and did my four years in the Navy, which was great. Met a lot of great people. And um, I occasionally did go to church. I remember twice I went to Mass um, just because I was feeling um, an unsettling, just unsettling yeah. feeling. And you'd already said that, that Mass had been a peaceful respite in the midst of everything else. Exactly. And so there were a couple of times that, you know, when I was um, challenged in the military, you know, and it does challenge us all, is um, I went to that refuge. And um, again, nothing really took. Um, I also remember, interestingly, is I was the, um, at the last duty station I was at, I was the um, equal, uh, equal opportunity officer. So I dealt with race issues amongst the enlisted group. And so uh, Martin Luther King um, celebration, his birthday, we had a huge event in the um, Baptist chapel. So I, because of my role, I was played a part in that. And you know, I was the only um, Caucasian in this um, <laughs> celebration. And I was blown away by the joy of the Lord. You know, just incredible. I mean, it was a huge choir, and it just was a joyous time. And it was my f second little exposure to Protestantism in the sense <laughs> that, you know, okay, you know, this is okay. They, they love God. They're, they're doing something here, and this is good, you know. And so um, got out of the military and um, started up the chain, you know, uh, that uh, most executives start off at, and I started in sales and just to learn what business was all about. And so I had a fairly large territories, mainly in New England and New York, um, selling medical supplies. And it was you know, a lucrative business and learned a lot and um, realized though that if I wanted to get further, I needed to get my MBA. So went back to Stern School of Business at NYU. And um, during that time, a little before it, um, God did something amazing to me, even though I didn't deserve it, which was he gave me this beautiful woman um, who has been, <clears throat> and I love her so much, my wife for 32 years, Dale. And um, what was amazing was, is, um, well, and I'll talk about the story later, um, she grew up in the Episcopal faith. In fact, actually, she went to um, uh, the National Cathedral School, which is you know the yeah. big cathedral down in Washington, D.C. And um, we dated for a year and a half, and it was time to get married, and we had zero faith. So we basically, from just a pure, you know, whatever standpoint, got married in the church that she didn't really go to much uh, down in D.C., and um, no Catholic priest. Um, and my parents, of course, went, and um, they were not happy. Yeah, in fact, I have a classic picture which is in my wedding book that the, <laughs> the photographer shot of the two of them sitting there going, okay, hmm, what have we done wrong, you know? And um, there was something there. There was something, again, that niggling, you know, uh, soul is restless until it yeah. rests in thee, O Lord, St. Augustine, you know. There just was this continuous background of restlessness. Um, something's wrong. So um, we got married and I started climbing the corporate ladder. And um, from there, um, we ended up, I got a couple of other jobs, and then I went overseas for about seven years working for some huge companies. And uh, one actually used to be based um, in Columbus, Ohio, and another one in St. Louis. And you know what's interesting was is I kept having discussions because I ended up actually in Beijing, serving, uh, you know, working in Beijing for a couple of years surrounded by atheists, you know, who had gone up through the communist regime. Yeah. And the interesting part is, and I know this played a part in, you know, me coming back to the Lord, was the absolute deadness 
of working with people that didn't know God, none of them. And, you know, we had a pretty big office, you know, with uh, uh, many salesmen, et cetera. I was the only American there, the only expat. And what was fascinating was talking to them about like a concept of God. And they didn't even know what you were talking about. Um, I remember sitting there one day, this was kind of amazing. Um, and we're, I was saying, I just looked across at our national sales manager. And uh, there were two of them actually, the different divisions. I said, are you, guys, are you happy? Are you happy? Just that simple question. And they were stymied. They had no idea what the question was. That was a question they never asked, you know? And I think part of it is because they didn't know what the joy of the Lord was, you know, or the joy of whatever. Yeah, it'd be fascinating to, to, to discuss uh, how you perceive their consciences, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of right or wrong, or even in business deals, you know, what, was it about not getting caught, or was there a sense of there's a rightness or a wrongness in this that would guide their decisions in their business? Well, it's sort of the perfect question because what happened was is they were doing evil. They were actually skimming off the you know top of our tax. You know, it's a long story of our tax rates, and um, it it was awful because for me, coming from the Western culture, you know, a Christian-based culture, right. I couldn't imagine some of the shenanigans that went on there. Hmm. And for me, it was a real eye opener. And I know, again, this was another block that was put into the back of my head is, is, okay, let's really look at life and what it's all about. And I sure knew that wasn't it, yeah. you know? Um, you know, two of the interesting stories that happened is, is we're driving by this huge brick factory one day um, because we went to very rural communities um, because I was working with uh, agricultural products and food products. And I said, gosh, I'm going to this brick factory. You know, here I am, uh, you know, 38-year-old man, 40-year-old man, I have no idea how to make a brick. And my national sales manager turned to me and she said, well, here's how you make a brick. And she went through the formula of making a brick, how it was done, how long the curing took. And I'm kind of looking at her going, and she was well-educated, she went to the States to get educated. I'm saying, well, how do you know that? And she said the first seven years of her life, she lived on a communist commune. And at the age of four, her job was to make bricks. Hmm. It's just amazing, you know, just amazing to think about this same earth, you know, we're yeah. all humans and that was her experience, you know? Yeah. And the, the other one that really hit me was, is um, we went to the town of one of the scientists, food scientists um, that, who grew up there. And so um, he honored me by bringing me to his house for, for dinner. And, um, you know, it was just such a blessing to do so. And his family was just so lovely, just, just lovely family. And they were talking, you know, in, um, in Mandarin, and uh, I had tried to learn, but <laughs> languages are not my skill. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and there seemed to be a sadness in the conversation. And so I asked, you know, what was that all about? And he said, well, we we're talking about my sister, who had um, died a number of years earlier. And I said, oh, gosh, you know, what did she die of? And he, he just, he said, I, I, I want you to try and imagine this. We had no food. We had no food for weeks. And she died because she ate ground rocks. And it seized up her insides, and she died of that. Whoa. And when you experience this firsthand, you're talking to the people where that happened, it, it's life-changing. And, you know, from that time on, pretty much, I have, you know, although I didn't know the Lord at that time, I was always very thankful for what I had. Yeah. You know, and sometimes we as Americans, we forget just how blessed we are to be in this country, you yeah. know? Even if... And we're struggling now about the, the loss of our Christian freedoms and that, but yet we still, to a very way that we don't realize, have a culture that has these values mm -hmm. as a part of it. And you're talking about going into a whole different part of the world that doesn't have any of that right. as the foundation for their lives. Why don't we pause there, Jack, and we'll take our, our mid-program break, and we'll come back in just a moment to hear more of Jack Tripp's stories.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host, and our, our guest tonight is Jack Tripp. And we've, we've paused you in the middle of uh, your journey to the top, right? Mm -hmm. You were you were, uh, great ambition. You're going to make a man out of yourself and a, a successful man, leaving the faith behind. But yet, the seeds of that faith were still awakening there to the to the reality of a of a godless culture. Yeah, and I will I will say this, and later on I, f I felt this and was able to really define it. My baptism followed me throughout my life. It was always there. You know, and but at this time I didn't know it. So we came after about six years. We came back to the states. Because your wife was with you during this whole time, right? She was with me during this entire oh, time. Yeah. Yep. And we were learning a lot about you know cultures and things of this nature. Nothing about spirituality. Oh. And so um, we came home, and I continued to do what I was doing, which is move up. And I became you know vice presidents and all of this. And. Um, we eventually, as I started moving to smaller companies, eventually ended up in Maine, um, a beautiful place um, on the coast working for this company. And um, there was this day that um, I had this great job, six-figure job. I had this great wife and um, all these beautiful friends. Um, we had just finished refurbishing this small little 1832 house it was beautiful, you know, really neat. Um, we did it historically, and it was just really great. And I'm living in this beautiful place on the coast of Maine. And I can remember sitting in my chair, and you know, I don't want to over-dramatize this in any way, but truly just sitting in my chair going, oh my goodness, I am, what, what's going on? I, I, this just means nothing to me. All of this means nothing to me. You know, vanity of vanities is basically what I ended up reading much later. And I said, what is going on here? I should be ecstatic, you know. And again, that restlessness that has followed me, you know, just overwhelmed me. And so in my desire to forget about it, I turn on the TV hoping to get a Red Sox game. And there was this old Baptist pastor, Charles Stanley, up there. And he's talking about a father and talking about the love of God. And literally just the words he said were the first truth I had heard because there was scripture that he was talking through, uh, mainly through John, as I remember it. And I just paused and just was mesmerized by it. And I realized something's got to change and that there's more to this than what I know and that um, I needed to surrender because this wasn't working because I'm not God. and. You know, I just was um, being crushed by the weight of trying to hold this world up by myself. And um, the amazing part was, is my wife and I never talked about any of this. A week later, um, the show came on again. And I asked my wife to just watch this thing. And I was really nervous because I, I thought she'd get up and say, what is this garbage? Because we had talked about you know, religion before and just literally I thought it was the opiate of the masses, as, as I said. And she said, oh, that's interesting. Let's get a Bible. And because I need more. And that started the journey. <laughs> and so for whatever reason, and maybe it had to do with the fact that um, we are sort of researchers and we both well educated, etc. And I just I praise God for that as we said, you know what, let's not go to church right now, let's read the Bible. And we spent two years just reading the Bible. And today is the greatest time to be a Catholic, a Christian, because it's so easy now to gain information, you know, great information. And if you're discerning and put the Holy Spirit in your heart, you can discern what's right and what's wrong. And so we started, we started getting study Bibles and started going to um, take a look, and frankly, for whatever reason, the Lord kept me away from the Catholic Church. So I was going to Jonathan Edwards, which was weird because I lived in Northampton, which he did a lot of his <laughs> preaching in at one time. Right, right. Um, you know, and just all of sort of the classics, Wesley and um, Calvin, I got the Institutes of the Christian Religion, read, you know, started reading Luther and their discussion about the Bible, and every morning what we did, and we we do it today, is that we have an hour and a half in the Bible. 
And for whatever reason, I do the reading because I comprehend more when I read out loud and my wife comprehends more when she hears it. <laughs> and we just started going at it. And we had the most intense Bible studies, I think, ever. Almost, and you know, I, I call them <laughs> knockdown drag out. We were, you know, just challenging everything and going to, you know, certain places to, to, to find answers, a lot of it, the Holy Spirit. And it was amazing to me because I tried to read the Bible, I know, many years ago. And you need God yeah. in your life yeah. to be able to the read grace. and understand the, yeah, grace. the grace, exactly. So um, we went through the Bible two times uh, before we even started to venture out into um, churches. And um, that was my first um, run in with the complexity of when you have decided that Catholicism is not your church, then where do you go? <laughs> and I had not realized how many denominations there were. So we ended up at a American Baptist denomination with a lovely, lovely pastor. Uh, pastor uh, Doug Scalise, and his father had been a pastor. He's a pastor, um, you know, PhD in homiletics, so he just gave great homilies and uh, you know, great sermons. And um, so we became, you know, good, um, good Baptists. And um, the interesting part was, I know why the Lord brought us to that church. He didn't bring us for the service. He brought us for the Bible study afterward. So for some reason, we were drawn to Bible. I just love the Bible so much, we both were. We went to this small Bible study after service and walked in and we're sitting there and one of the true mentors in our life walked in and she was a 84-year-old um, adjunct professor at Gordon-Conwell. Um, and her name was uh, Kathy Clark Kroger. And um, she's, she was a pretty prolific author. She actually wrote a woman's study Bible, which is used by a lot of women. And um, she was, you know, um, uh, fluent in Greek, and she'd bring the Greek Bible, and um, you know, was a great theologian. And she took us under her wing, and um, showed us such kindness and love. And what was amazing about her, and I really have always used this, is no matter what you know, she she would never make you feel like she was all knowledgeable, and you were so, you know, sit at my feet and listen. <laughs> she was so humble. And she helped us just greatly start looking at um, the Bible in different ways and challenging us and just loving on us and showing what true Christianity was all about. Her, actually, her husband was a, uh, a retired Presbyterian pastor. He went to Fuller and um, Yale undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And so she was an incredible blessing to us. And one of the things she did is start pushing me uncomfortably to, to start taking all this business background I had and use it for good, for the good of God. And you know, she said, of course, wherever you are um, will be by, used by God, but you, you need to get into some kind of ministry. And so what happens is, is the guy I was working for is working for this electronics firm. He was on the board of a homeless shelter. So um, he had to drop off a donation and I walked in and something happened. Call it Holy Spirit, you call it whatever. <laughs> Hackles on the back of my neck went up and I said, I've, I've got to do this. So, um, what happened was through a series of me finding out some information and people sharing information, um, it ended up that there was a position open totally across the country in Eugene, Oregon for someone to head up a gospel rescue mission. And so um, I was the most unlikely candidate to get that job. And in fact, all through the process, the board kept saying, well, we've got two other candidates that are much better, but for some reason we'll keep talking to you. And then <laughs> that happened three or four times. And finally we flew out, my wife and I, and stood in the middle of a room at the end of the whole visit. And um, they laid hands on us and we prayed and everyone cried. And we knew it was the Holy Spirit. And so that was- And your wife was supportive of this radical move out of industry to- she was, what, she was whatever the Lord was calling me yeah, to do, she, was, she wanted to do. And she is a true woman of the Lord. She loves God so much. Mm -hmm. And so um, we went out to Eugene, Oregon. I can't even pronounce, I have to, it's, it's, that's how it's pronounced. And um, three and a half, almost four years ago. And I went to work for this extremely large, serving at this large um, homeless shelter, um, serving the least and the loss, as it says in Matthew 25. And um, it has been an amazing, amazing experience. Um, serving the least and the lost um, grows you in your faith because you do see Jesus Christ 
in the faces of those yeah. that are being served. And it is a humbling experience. We use a lot of different um, Bible um, stories and scripture, um, but there's one, you know, where Christ, um, the apostles ask Christ, well, this guy's blind. You know, why is it him or, or because of his parents that it happens? Well, it's neither. It's, you know, to show God's grace. And that's what we do. Mm -hmm. All of the love that's poured into the homeless, whether, you know, it's the Eugene Mission or all of the, um, the Christian services doing so, Catholic Community Services being the biggest one um, in the country, um, are just for showing God's glory by doing so. And so I'm all happy serving the Lord and rocking and rolling and doing what God's calling me to do and making changes through prayer and making the mission uh, a better place to bring glory to God. And I'd say it is all his glory. And got to know the uh, a city official, the chief of police in the town really well, he was Catholic. And he was good friends with a Protestant uh, pastor um, that I also was good friends of me. So we were having lunch and um, after the lunch, um, the, the Protestant pastor said to me, you know what, we got to evangelize to him. You know, this Catholicism is, you know, it's fine, but we got to bring him on over. And I said, okay, great. So, um, Did you have, well, I don't want to interrupt your flow of your thing, no, no. But, uh, uh, but often ex-Catholics are almost more anti-Catholics than the average. Yeah, no, I, w I was never anti-Catholic. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't want to make that It just clear. wasn't a part of your just wasn't a part of my radar. It was like I was neg never negative. I just didn't think about it. You know, when I ended up going to that Baptist church and then a big evangelical church in Eugene, the thought just never crossed my mind. And one other thing, from the time you had that day, remember, mm -hmm. to the time now you're serving at this point, how, how many years was that? Um, that was uh, about 10 years. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, the Lord had brought you a long way. A long way. A long I mean, way. radically long ways yeah. through the preaching of Stanley and reading the Bible with you and your wife. And I mean, that's powerful. Well, what was really powerful is when, be, as a executive director at a mission, you need to give sermons. So I went from, <laughs> you know, suddenly having, and my sermons always started with, please look at me, I am not a pastor, okay? I am the last person on earth to be a pastor, but let's talk about this scripture. And um, so, what happened was, is I realized in evangelizing to this friend of mine, I had no idea what Catholicism was all about. And I'm sitting there going, I spent 18 years and 22 years in there. Why didn't I know anything? You know, and again, I blame myself. There's no other blame. So I started down the road. And I started with some of the, you know, basic apologetics. Uh, Carl Adams, um, Bob Sunjanese, um, you know, yeah. Scott Hahn, of course. Yeah. And all those sort of basic apologetics about the Catholic faith. And I'm reading through and I'm going, why didn't I know this? You know, why didn't I know this? Oh, no, no one's worshiping Mary. We're venerating. Well, yeah, but communion of saints, you don't die. I under okay, I can get this communion of saints. I get Mary. Um, and then I just kept reading and reading and that drew me back to some of the greats. And of course, St. Augustine, um, St. Ambrose before him, um, I started, you know, reading St. Ignatius. I read, then read the Summa. Uh, which I had no understanding, then read the Summa, the Summa, and Peter Kreeft is it? Yeah. yeah, I read his conversion story. And um, so I started reading a number of things. I, um, I read a couple of great books on, uh, on Mary um, that were um, St. Alfonso de la Gloria right. was a big one, and um, St. Louis de Montfort. Right. Yeah, and those were just, they're, they're killer book. They're just so good. And I, I said, okay, I'm getting this. And then the amazing thing is, um, I went online and said, I gotta buy this catechism thing. I gotta buy it. I didn't know there was a catechism. Of course, there wasn't when I was a kid growing up. So I get it and I spent the entire night reading the catechism. And I um, ended that night and I sat there going, oh my goodness, what have I done? You know, and I literally prayed then, I'm so sorry, God. I'm so sorry, you know, that I turned my back on the fullness of this faith. At the same time, as this is all going on, a couple of amazing things happen. Is number one is my brother-in-law, who was only 48, had a stroke. And um, it really affected me because I really loved the guy. And um, I'm sitting there in my office and found out about it. And I just needed to get out. I needed to get out because my grief was really there. And I was there and I said, I need to go to some sort of place that's holy. And I just sat there and go, there's a Catholic church downtown, St. Mary. I'm just going to go there. <clears throat> This I get a little choked up about. Yeah. 
I walked into the church for Mass, and uh, just the floodgates opened up. I cried the entire Mass. I felt terrible for the people. Luckily, it was a Friday <laughs> service at noon, so there weren't too many people, and I sat in the back. But I am weeping, just weeping. And everything, all my past just came out. Uh, the entire, my entire life almost came out of that Mass. And when I saw him raise the Eucharist, the hunger was just so incredible. I just, I can't even really describe it. <clears throat> and I realized that something had to change in my life. Mm -hmm. And so what was interesting is I took that Friday Mass and started attending Mass for about nine months, just going. I had no idea what I was doing. I was still going to my evangelical mm -hmm. service on Sunday. Um, at the same time, one of the guys I was working with said, you know, you're sort of contemplative. When you pray, you pray alone. Why don't you go up to Mount Angel, this monastery, a Benedictine monastery. The seminary is also there for, and this was not a Catholic person, it was a Protestant, but you like it. A lot of Protestants go there. And I went there and I suddenly realized um, as I sat and went to the Liturgy of the Hours that I thought I'd be going up there seeing a bunch of guys. What are they doing? They're not doing anything. They're praying. This is nothing. Go out and do something. And I realized that um, as I walked in there, these guys were holding up the entire world is how I put it through their prayer. And from that time on, I just have such an affinity for the Benedictines and just, mm -hmm. I go, that's my retreat place. And if anyone is in Oregon, please go to Mount Angel. It's not too far from Portland. It is a beautiful retreat house and it is a wonderful place up on a hill um, built by um, Swiss folks back in the late 1800s. Um, other things happen as well. And all of it finally came down to the pastor of St. Mary, which is the church I had been to in Eugene, came on a tour because I wanted to get all the churches involved. Um, the entire group came and I basically looked him in the face and I said, I want to come home. Please bring me home. And he said, I can do that. You know, and he said, and all the guys that are around him, some of the Knights of Columbus and stuff are going, this is what we dream of, you know. <laughs> so um, we went through a process. I had to get um, my marriage convalidated and um, went to, of course, my first confession in um, years, many, like 32 years, 32 years. That took a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, and got in right standing with the church, and it was literally almost uh, a year ago is I walked up that aisle and took the Eucharist, and I was so hungry for it. And the transformation, I would say, over this last year has been uh, pretty astounding. You know, and I know you've talked a lot about this fullness of the faith and what it means. And, um, you know, I praise God for my Protestant brothers and sisters, and they did a lot for me in this journey as far as getting me to Holy Scripture. The church brought me home. Yeah. And the fullness, living a sacramental life is just so phenomenal. I was talking about reconciliation, which I am a proponent of going often with um, one of my Southern Baptist uh, friends. And after it was over and explaining it, the beauty of it and how I run to it, you know, I don't dread it, I run to it. They're sitting there going, that's cool. I'd like to do that. And I said, well, it's a long process in getting there, but I'll, you know, I'll work with you on that. But um, that sacramental life to me has brought me so close to the Lord. I was gonna say the, the sacramental life is so key that sets you apart. I mean, some might say, well, you had Jesus, mm -hmm. why do you gotta make this radical? jump. Why not just stay, once you've appreciated the great history of the church more, why not just stay where you are? Yeah. But a lot of it was the sacramental life. Well, here was an amazing thing that happened. One of the things, I was going to this large evangelical church. They have communion occasionally. And the communion was over, it's, you know, bread and wine and small cups over on the side um, with the um, donation offering as well. And I walked over there and my wife had pointed out later is, they had taken the Eucharist from being the key to the service to putting it over on the side and the pastor's sermon becomes the key to the service. Yeah. And by going you know, back to the, to the faith, um, you know, Christ is first and foremost. I meant to ask you how your, your partner was on this journey. So right now she is, loves the Lord. She feels so blessed and can see I am a better husband, I am a better <laughs> neighbor, I am a better everything than I was before. Um, she has not taken that, that step at this point, um, and we'll see what that journey brings. And what about your mission? Because I know you've got a wonderful work with the, 
you'd probably take a moment because we've got about five minutes left okay. about your mission, but also then your own journey of the Catholic faith in relation to your mission. Right. It's, so it's been interesting. Um, this is a purely even started by evangelical uh, business guys and is very much an evangelical uh, ministry. Um, so the mission's incredible. It, we now call it, we've changed it from being a homeless shelter to being a wellness shelter for the homeless. And how that came about was the um, Pool of Bethesda story where Christ asked the individual who'd been at the um, you know, Pool of Bethesda for 38 years, do you want to get well? And the person, of course, gave excuses, you know, the water's got to be stirred up by the saint, and you just, you know, take up your mat and walk. We realize that is what we have to be to the homeless, mm -hmm. many of who are mentally ill or physically ill or addicted. We need to help them to get well. So sometimes we have to pull them up by their bootstrings to do so. So everything we do is focused around helping them to get well, including a closer walk with God. Um, so we have now a one-year program called Life Change that's Christ-centered, that's changed the face of the mission. Um, we also, for a dignity standpoint, and you know, uh, Catholic social justice is all about human dignity, everyone there works um, at the mission. They all do an hour and a half chore to give them some dignity. It's also a sober house so that uh, you can't get well if you're not sober. Um, I had to go to the board you know, a year ago, a year and a half ago, and tell them, this is what's happening to me. I'm coming back to the Catholic faith. And it totally confused them. Um, it totally disturbed them. But they said, look, are you a Christian and do you love the Lord? And I said, I really do. So then let's see what happens. And I give them such great credit and st uh, for the strength to do that. And God has blessed it big time. Well, I think in our lifetime that we've seen the grace of the Holy Spirit changing hearts on both sides of the Amen. of the river, uh, Catholics and, and non-Catholic Christians. Uh, and it's where it often comes together is where we're standing side by side fighting the same battles. Not so much fighting the battles against each other, but if it's against abortion or against contraception, but in your case, helping the poor. Amen. You know, And we really have a model for that in, in uh, Catherine Doherty as well as Dor Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day, right. Dorothy Day, and, and I said, wait a sec, we've got, uh, what have you seen? When you help a poor person, you're helping Jesus mm -hmm. uh, in that. And I was thinking of St. Francis. We have an email which kind of connects us with this question. Bella from New Hampshire writes, Pope Francis continually reminds us to care for the poor and marginalized in our world. Has the Pope's witness encouraged or inspired Jack in his work with the homeless. How do you think regular Catholics can be better at serving the poor in our everyday lives? Yeah, and it, it, big time. I mean, the Pope has been has such an impact on serving the homeless. And it's interesting, I talked with a, a good friend of mine who works, uh, who heads up Catholic Charities in Eugene. And both of us said that the impact, it's, it's a strength he has that gives us the strength to continue on and knowing that this is in right pleasing with the Lord and you know what I'd say for people that want to serve, for Catholics that want to serve, I would go down to your local homeless shelter and ask for a tour. And it is amazing what happens. The Holy Spirit will move you. And the Holy Spirit will guide you as to what kind of service you can do there. Maybe you're a cook and he's given you skills at cooking and you want to go serve in the kitchen. Great. Maybe you're a counselor and you could be a counselor. At the, you could be giving haircuts. You could be doing a number of things. That's my suggestion is really go down and as... Um, uh, Pope Francis says the, you know, the, um, the everyone needs to get their, the, you have to smell like the sheep. You know, priests who smell, smell like their sheep will come down and get involved with the homeless and get in there and physically come down. And the Lord will direct your ways as to where um, you should serve there. And, yeah. and it is an honor to do so. You will be blessed. Yeah. You will be blessed. I was thinking that sometimes on the evangelical side, following the founders of Luther and Calvin were committed to faith alone, and sometimes they were hesitant to get involved in the works. Right. And they were sometimes uh, skeptical of the social gospel. On the other hand, there are many Catholics that were very committed to the social gospel, but forgot Jesus in the process. Amen. So together, we remind ourselves that it's about Christ. Yep. And, and imitating Christ and going out and help the poor. And I think that is the strength. And I, however God uses me, I just humbly do so. Um, but maybe there's some reason for me being there as a Catholic in a Protestant ministry. And I sometimes can see that to kind of bridge that gap. So. But you also talk about the strength of the sacraments that empower you to do your work. Amen. And they see me every day. I go to church. Every day I take the Eucharist unless there's some emergency that happens. And they've all asked, where are you going? I go to Mass and I pray for this place and I take the Eucharist because there's no place 
There's no moment in a Christian's life to be closer to God than when you've actually eaten him, eaten his flesh and body, as it says in John 6, by the way, <laughs> which I tell all my, my evangelical friends. So. All right, Jack, thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing for with us on the journey home and for your service to our Lord and his church in the place where he's called to serve. Praise God. And again, that's eugenemission.org if you want to find out more about Jack and what he does there. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I pray that Jack's story, as well as his service, is an inspiration to you and to me. God bless you. See you next week.